right now, you and I and Taylor and everybody watching, we all have the most complex, most advanced piece of technology in the known universe inside your head. That's your brain, right? But the question that you have probably asked yourself before is how could this thing, how could our brains have evolved through natural selection, through purely natural processes? So in this episode, that is what we're talking about. We're going to be talking about evolution from single celled organisms all the way to human beings, all the way to our current brains and everything in between. Welcome to The Social Brain. I'm Andrew. And I'm Taylor. And this is a show where we dive into how the brain works. If you've ever wondered what's going on inside your mind, even the things that you're not even aware of, then this is the place where we can unpack that and really explore it. All right, so welcome back, everybody. This is going to be a really fun episode because uh, we're going to go back billions of years and track how our brains came to be, right? This is one of the most fascinating things to me. Like this is something that that I spend a lot of time thinking about trying to put into context a lot of the things that, that I study in the brain. Like uh, when this part of the brain lights up, uh, why is it lighting up when I'm thinking about myself? Like, what does that really mean? And how did it get to a point where it can form a concept of, of the self, where it can, where our brain can, can track goals, where we can have knowledge about like the thousands of things, like the amount of words in the dictionary. It, it's incredible, right? Uh, but it had to have kind of progressed in somewhat of a linear manner. Uh, if you really look across the animal kingdom, uh, most vertebrates have the essential parts for the brain that we have, right? It's uh, there's We're going to talk about how it's been refined and how it's kind of specialized to be able to do the things that we do now. But cognition has taken this really cool kind of trajectory. And we're going to try to track like how that happened and how that might be applicable to you maybe understanding your brain a little bit better and why it does the same, the things that it does. Yeah, and that's that's definitely the goal. And I think like since we're talking about evolution, it's so important to talk about what what is evolution, what's natural selection, um, because I think there's just even even now there are a lot of misconceptions about what is meant by evolution. Um, so all right, evolution, the word just means like change over time. And when we talk about biology, we're talking about the change of, of species over time, the development of new kinds of animals and plants and whatever it might be. Um, so, the, but then the mechanism of evolution is the, probably the most important thing to understand. And that is natural selection, right? This was like discovered by Charles Darwin and Alfred Wessel Wallace in the mid 1850s. And this is the idea that basically you've got, um, so this term selection refers to like, the environment naturally allowing for for certain variations in organisms to survive and reproduce all right and so basically what we're talking about is we natu individuals naturally vary on on small uh dimensions right it could be just a single gene that has changed uh through mutation right and if that mutation confers some kind of adaptive advantage, some kind of advantage for that organism in terms of survival and reproduction, then statistically over time, when you look at the grand scale of like Earth's history and the history of life, that change is going to be preserved, right? It's going to be, uh, it, it's going to allow that organism to reproduce more than the other similar organisms in its environment. So over time, you can get changes and adaptations to the environment. And this that's kind of like the basic idea of evolution. Um, I do, I have a, a quote that I, I did want to like read just to make sure that I'm, I get this a uh, little bit more eloquently than what I just said. So this comes from uh, Helena Cronin uh, writing in her book, uh, the, the Ant and the Peacock. And she writes that, um, so uh, Darwin and Wallace assumed that living things evolved. The problem was to find the mechanism by which this evolution had occurred. And then she says, um, individuals vary and some of their variations are heritable. These heritable variations arise randomly, that is independently of their effects on the survival and reproduction of the organism. 
but they are perpetuated differentially depending on the adaptive advantage they confer. Thus, over time, populations will come to consist of the better adapted organisms, and as circumstances change, different adaptations become advantageous, gradually giving rise to divergent forms of life. So that's better. Yeah, I mean, a great, a great example of this is uh, like polar bears right now, right? Like we have these uh, these polar ice caps that are breaking apart and retracting and all of these things. The the types of polar bears that are able to kind of survive and and kind of migrate and, and get across these things uh, are the ones that are going to perpetuate in the population. And they're the ones that are going to then serve as the next generation, right? Uh, and this is, this is something that I've always, uh, it's going to come up throughout this conversation. Something that, that kind of, doesn't sit easy with me with a lot of these ideas of Darwinian evolution uh, is just the idea that it's entirely random. Um, I don't know if we understand like epigenetics enough yet or whatever it may be, but when you look at the evolution of the brain, like we're going to get into, it's, it's pretty incredible how environmental challenges will produce direct changes in the brain in that animal's lifetime in terms of like how it's mapping motor sequences to certain types of environmental demands and all of those kind of things. Uh, and so it's always, it's always just been tough for me to like, like I, I get the whole Darwinian evolution selection, random mutations. Uh, but I, I, I don't know if there's like a missing piece of there being some type of agency in the process in terms of how the, the animal is actually interacting with the environment. Is there something happening within that generation that may be kind of, producing the possibility of these kind of random mutations. I don't know. That's completely <laughs> speculation. But I, I think what we want to do kind of with this idea in mind of, of kind of this idea of these advantages that certain animals end up kind of obtaining somehow, then get passed on and, and the body starts to morph, the brain starts to morph. Let's take this back to like billions of years to the first cells, because I think one of the most interesting things about evolution, about especially talking about the brain and how the brain evolved, is that we have this idea that, that neurons are really special, that they're the only things that can communicate or whatever that may be. Uh, but single cells are incredible. The kind of things that they can do, the way that they can communicate with one another, like they have ion channels. It's been shown that bacteria have kind of the, the things that are precursors for what neurons end up using. Uh, it's just how neurons are able to do this over long distance that gives them kind of a better advantage. But each of these individual cells is in some aspects kind of an individual living thing. Uh, and you have to think like bacteria is the most successful species on the face of the planet. Like they have been around for billions of years and have survived. They haven't gotten complex, but they're still here, right? Yeah. Yeah. Cells are incredible for sure. It was yeah. <laughs> like, I, I studied molecular biology in college and it was always just fascinating to me to think about how it was these, I, I always use this term. Um, they're like hyper sophisticated Rube Goldberg machines. You know, those <laughs> machines where you, you push over a domino and it push, it uh, knocks over a pile of dominoes. And then that hits some kind of lever that lights a match that, pops a balloon that does like all these this weird convoluted machine that was kind of, that's kind of how I think about what cells are doing is they have this super sophisticated molecular um, interactions that allow them to actually do things in the world. And like Taylor mentioned, bacteria are this example of a super um, simple in some ways organism that is, definitely a precursor to to the sorts or it is a um it's a an, an, it's analogous to a precursor of our cells in our body and so we what i mean by that is we have a common ancestor with bacteria right and so our cells are uh in some way really deeply related to bacteria and there are actually these since we're going to be talking about cognition and the brain and, and learning a lot in this episode, I think it's important to recognize that there is a kind of learning that can go on in, in bacteria, in single cells. Um, and there, there are different ways of looking at this, but one is uh, the one I find really fascinating is that bacteria can pick up DNA from their environment. And, in, and they can actually transfer DNA directly to and from each other. And there's multitude of mechanisms 
of how this happens, but what it can result in is the bacteria, when it pulls in this DNA sequence that it didn't have before, it can then decode that sequence and then produce a protein that it never had before. And so I, you know, you can look at that as kind of a form of learning or adaptation, like it learned to create this new protein, right? And I, I would argue that's not conscious cognitive learning, but it's a, <laughs> it's a precursor. It's a, it's a form of behavioral learning, at least. Uh, I mean, and there's, there's arguments for what's called basal cognition. Uh, there's this really fascinating work by Pamela Lyon and uh, all of these people kind of in her sphere. Mike Levin is one of these people that we've talked about before on this, on the show, but uh, they talk a lot about how there is some type of cognition that's happening in single cells. Like these bacteria have these, these incredible, I, I think E. coli is one of these ones that have these, these receptor arrays, these chemoreceptor arrays that are incredibly complex, like on one side of, of the bacterium that, that kind of resemble like a mini cellular brain in a way where it's it's uh looking it can hook up to i think she said they had sites for uh, i might be getting this wrong but like 20 different ligands which means that they can sense up to 20 different things in their environment and so they can track chemical gradients they can they can use those chemical gradients to find food to to move towards things they can use other chemical gradients to avoid things right uh and there is this evidence in these single cells for kind of uh this uh, Pavlovian type conditioning, which would is kind of later called mere association, is this idea that like this this thing, this nutrient level is associated with with good kind of survivability, and so I'm going to learn to move towards those type of gradients and to stay in those types of gradients. Um, and this, like, even in these kind of simpler kind of uh, as we get into eukaryotes, the kind of animal cells and things like that, this stuff is is preserved. Like most animals have some form of Pavlovian conditioning where they can learn associations in the environment that are conducive to their survival. And this kind of serves as the foundation for how we then build on top of that cognition towards like a more complicated one like we have today. Yeah. And, and, um, you know, in the present day, we have our individual cells in our bodies are learning in some sense they can like we've talked about neuroplasticity before and this is a great example of how individual cells change their morphology their th like their anatomy their and mm -hmm. their behavior in response to what's going on in their environment and it's through these really complex molecular mechanisms um, where they can maybe increase the amount of receptors on their surface or even grow a new dendrite or dendritic spine. And they can do these things um, that are dependent on them kind of reacting and then learning in a permanent sort of way from the environment. And I think this sets up something really important to talk about. Um, something that's, that's really common in a lot of these spheres that are talking about the evolution of the brain. Uh, they're, they're very heavily focused on the brain as a control mechanism, that the, the brain itself is this series of feedback loops. Uh, you can think about a thermostat as a really good example. A thermostat is set to 72 degrees. It has a way of monitoring its environment to see if it's too hot, to see if it's too cold. And then when it registers that something is out of homeostasis, is out of sync, it's able to then adapt its behavior to do something different. And this is something that's seen all across life, all the way down to single cells, right? You have these cells that are able to detect things in the environment and change their behavior. Uh, and when you look at a lot of kind of the ancient neurotransmitters, it seems that these kind of served that function. Dopamine, serotonin are really, really ancient. You see these in like really simple organisms where you have an organism that the idea is that they have to maintain their physiology. They have to maintain all of the stuff that's going inside of them. Like Andrew was saying, these kind of like these Rube Goldberg machines, they have to maintain a certain nutrient density inside of them. But they have a way of understanding that something is out of balance inside of them. Um, and there's a lot of stuff that shows that like dopamine kind of served as the signal early on that when dopamine was high, it meant that there's something good right here. We have nutrients that we're able to take in, we're able to, but once dopamine dropped, that means that the environment is now scarce, that there's nothing. And now we need to now move because in order to, to maintain these nutrients, we have to keep eating. Right. And so there's these, these mechanisms that start popping up that say like, okay, this thing's low change your behavior. This thing's low. And serotonin on the other side was measuring like whether or not I was full or not. So like, I don't need to go exploring. I don't need to spend energy if I already have everything that I need. 
right? And so there, it, you start to see these kind of interactions happen between these neurotransmitters, these, these kind of chemical messengers that are essentially signals like a thermostat would be of saying like this particular portion of our physiology is out of balance. And that requires a very specific behavior. And I think that that right there is, I think, one of the most important things moving forward is that the nervous system itself, as we get into nervous systems, are a sensory motor type thing, sensing the environment to then cause some type of movement, some kind of change to put something back into balance. Yeah, that, I don't want to get <clears throat> too far down this cell route, but you've awakened my inner molecular biology nerd. And I just want to give people a sense of like the mechanism of, of something similar to what Taylor's talking about. So like, um, you know, single cells will produce um, an enzyme, right? A protein that breaks down sugar molecules so they can use those sugar molecules as fuel. But how does it know when to stop producing that enzyme? How does it know when there's, when there's too much of that enzyme in the cell? One way is, well, how does it know when to start producing it is a better question. So if sugar, if it's taking in a lot of sugar, that sugar can activate a, um, basically activate the production of that enzyme by interacting with, with the DNA essentially. And that can cause the production of this enzyme that then breaks down those sugar molecules. And then when there's a low concentration of sugar, it essentially shuts that gene off, right? So then there's no more enzyme uh, to break down the sugar because there's there's no sugar in the cell. So that's a simplification. And I know I got some details wrong there, but sure. that's a that's like the base one one way of just thinking about these kind of feedback loops that Taylor's talking about. Um, and uh, so as we get into um, kind of more complex biology, that'll be something to keep in mind. So, I mean, we'll move forward, right? So we have these single cells that are capable of what some people call basal cognition, right? This, this ability to sense their environment, to change their behavior, right? They're living things. Uh, but we have this transition then to, to multicellularity, to, to, to colony type life, right? And there's a big difference between an animal and a colony of single cells. And this was a really interesting kind of transition that it may be an explanation why there's not like a ton of animals in the universe or whatever, because this is a really hard transition to make. Uh, so we talked about bacteria. After a while, we start having animal cells, which are eukaryotic, which are bigger. Uh, they also enveloped a bacteria that became mitochondria that allowed them to produce energy a lot more efficiently because they could use oxygen. And it just so happened that at that time, like billions of years ago, there's a ton of oxygen in the atmosphere. And so they started to proliferate and started to uh, started to end up in predation kind of modes where they were eating other single cells. And so in order to survive, they started to band together into colonies. And so you start having these colonies of single cells, which are, are fascinating, right? Because there, there's this really intricate communication between these cells where some cells are taking on like feeding behavior and some cells are taking on protective behavior uh, where each individual cell is capable of doing all of those things, but they stop doing one of those things in service of like the group, the colony. Um, they're, they have adhesion molecules, so they're connected to one another in a certain way. Um, but there was this problem in colonies where you have what's called defection. You have certain cells that like won't do anything, but will eat a bunch of nutrients. Or you have some cells where if it starts to get threatening or whatever, we'll just ditch the colony altogether and then it all kind of spreads out. Uh, and so they think that the first animals actually were, uh, were clonal copies that it was like one mother cell and a bunch of clones that were all identical to one another. And that kind of, they think that that served as like reducing the defection, reducing that they were all kind of working as kind of a hive mind and they were collected, connected to each other. Um, but that started kind of the first multicellular life. Yeah. And that, so eventually we're going to jump from multicellular organisms to, to animals, but, um, but it's again like important to realize that even before nervous systems arose before we had like animals as we think of them today uh there are these really interesting collective uh behaviors that can arise among these kinds of yeah. um uh, multicellular organisms so taylor was talking about uh just colonies just kind of like they are 
in a sense, a multicellular organism, but they're, they're sort of a proto multicellular organism. They're not quite uh, acting all together, but eventually you do get um, cells acting together as a, as a single unit, right? And um, they can do really interesting, really complex things, even without a brain, right? And we know this, right? Because there are examples of this all over the place. Look outside and see the grass and the trees and all the plants and fungi and everything. Those are complex multicellular organisms that are able to have this really interesting behavior and a kind of learning that isn't really um, isn't dependent on a nervous system, yeah. right? And you know, uh, plants can. I mean, there's there's all kinds of interesting plants. I'm thinking right now of a <laughs> like a Venus flytrap, right? It's got this uh, just mechanism that allows it to. I don't know. I don't know that much about these things, but to like when a fly lands in it, it snaps down. Right. And that's all, there's no real nervous system there. It's just these, again, it, we can boil it down to these uh, complex molecular feedback mechanisms, but happening now between cells and as a, as a whole organism. Right. So we're kind of trying to build up this picture of more and more complex behavior and learning mechanisms. I think one of the things that I've always, this kind of analogy that I've always used to try to understand uh, the evolution of cognition, of information transfer, whatever it may be, is you have to realize first that cells can communicate, right? There's this common mis misconception that that's just neurons, that neurons are the only ones that can communicate, but all of these cells are communicating, right? And something that I've, I've liked to think about is comparing the evolution of the organism to the evolution of society, right? Think about the ways that that small kind of hunter gatherer type tribes communicate with each other, right? It's it's all local. It's all communicating with one another within this small group, right? This small colony of cells, uh, and that's very kind of similar to these chemical messages that they're sending back and forth to one another. They're very short range. They can only talk to people that are right next to them, right? But as the thing starts to get more complex, it starts to get bigger. As you start to develop a tribe, as you start to have this tribe and another tribe that's nearby that are working together in some way, you have to now have some way of communicating more long distance. And this is where kind of hormone transmission comes onto the scene, where now you're you're still able, the cells are all able to talk to each other, but now they're able to send these kind of long range signals to one another uh, in the form of these kind of chemical messengers. Uh, and this is kind of where we start to see these needs arise as these, these animals become more complex. There needs to be a faster type of transmission because that hormone transmission is like the horse going to the next tribe, right? Like the message might get there, but it might be really late, right? And that's how these hormones are. They're really slow. It gets there, but then the change happens and like the coordination isn't there. And so you need this need for really long range, fast communication. And that's where kind of neurons kind of come on the scene. You think about like radio transmission in societies, right? Uh, it, it's this analogous thing to, to how like society is building a brain or whatever. But uh, that's where the reason I think why we see so much uh, nervous system type stuff in animals, as opposed to like Andrew was just saying with, with plants and with fungi and things like that, is that animals move. And movement requires tons and tons of coordination, right? The tree is able to use those really slow kind of horse on a horseback message, right? Because they don't need to move through the environment. They can send that signal and that, that route's still going to be there in an hour, right? Uh, that coordination isn't as necessary to avoid predators, to do whatever you need to do. And so now we start to see these multicellular things, which have differentiated tissues, right? In colonies, each of the cells was able to do every job. But now in multicellular organisms, those cells have lost the ability to, to protect or to feed or whatever. They've what's called exported their fitness to the organism. They've said, you know what, I'm just going to do this job. And I'm going to do that so that you can, so that the organism itself can survive. You're mentioning hormone signaling. And I would even, the thing about hormone signaling is it's not very precise, right? Yeah. You can't um, specifically tell a certain group of cells to do this and then another group of cells to, to not do this, at least not very easily, yeah. right? Because hormone signaling is basically, you're just sending molecules into the blood that are going to affect populations of cells in a certain way, right? But with nervous systems, what you can do is you can have these these like really interesting uh, branching um, networks, basically, that are able to 
communicate and coordinate the activity among these disparate groups of cells. And then that allows for even more of that kind of specialization that you're talking about, where, you know, now the liver is doing one thing and the, you know, the spleen is doing another thing. And, but those can be coordinated in a, uh, a in an important way. So I think, yeah, it's really important to, to realize like the nervous system is about communication and coordination and precise <laughs> and fast communication. Mm -hmm. Totally. Uh, and we start to see this, like the first animals that look like they really have some type of like nervous system, some type of uh, neuron activity are what are called the cnidarians. You can think of jellyfish, right? Uh, and it's it's no surprise that the nervous system, the first nervous systems that, that arose, arose on the outer layer of the organism, right? Uh, in terms of like detecting the environment, sensing the environment, and then controlling the movement. And today our neurons still come from the same germ layer that our skin cells come from. Uh, that that is kind of this. Uh, I think that's where the cell lines are, are very similar because it's about detecting and, and being involved with the external world and moving through the external world. And these first things were they were nerve nets. There was a there was an apical uh, nervous system which was at the top, uh, and there was a blastoporal nervous system that was at the bottom. And one of them was responsible for sensing stuff, for chemo sensation, uh, for light detection. And then the other one was about using that sensory information to do coordinated movements, whether it was local random movements that were like, okay, there's, there's food right here around me. So I'm just going to kind of randomly move around this environment right here until I get all the food that I need. But then all of a sudden you see this huge shadow coming. Now you need to engage long range movement. So you need to change the way you're coordinating those kind of contractile movements to now do really long range escape from the predator type movements. So you start to see the, the like the first kind of control mechanisms in terms of feeding and avoiding approach and avoidance. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and as you're mentioning the, the cnidarians and the kind they're related to jellyfish, but they were even simpler. Uh, they, they are jellyfish are a type of cnidarian for sure. But, um, like the first ones were even simpler than jellyfish. And the thing that, uh, has really struck me in learning about this is, um, our, so our enteric nervous system, the nervous system that, uh, governs our, our gut, our digestive system basically is, very similar in structure to the nervous system of the cnidarians. And so this has led some people to say, well, the, the enteric nervous system, the nervous system governing the digestion uh, of the organism, basically that was the first evolutionarily ancient brain. That was like the first thing. Right. And so it's, um, what did, what was it for? Like, like Taylor's mentioning in the cnidarians, well, it was for both movement and digestion. Yeah. So it's it's this nerve net that allows the organism to kind of pump water through its body and thereby pull nutrients in and then do digestion. So it's this combination of movement and digestion at the same time. So exactly what, what you're just talking about. That's that. No, that's that's fascinating. And yeah, it's uh it's interesting because it like sponges were the first animal, but then there's this like polyp stage from the sponge that kind of looks like a jellyfish. And they think that that like that polyp stage ended up just evolving into its own animal uh, and becoming the cnidarians and then developing neurons or whatever it may be. Uh, it's, it's super, super cool. And one of the things that is, is really interesting. So you have most of these cnidarians are radial symmetrical they're symmetrical in a, a radial dimension. So they're circled. So you can cut them at, at any point and wherever you cut them, you're going to have this symmetrical half, right? But then something happened around that time where the entire body folded into a tube. Um, and the interesting thing is that you had this kind of this motor type nervous system at the bottom and you had this kind of sensory type nervous system at the top but when it folded into a tube there was this overlap that ended up becoming the head and that's where like the brain ends up being so now you have this overlap of sensory and motor within like a, a cord that goes along the whole body to be able to control the movement in the body uh that becomes your first kind of proto vertebrates uh, and this is this is cambrian explosion for some reason when animals became bilateral so they're no more they're not radially symmetrical anymore. Now they're a tube that you can only cut in one way. And then you have two identical halves. 
And for some reason, that bilateral body plan was really successful. And there was this just explosion of life all of a sudden with tons of different variations of this bilateral plan. Yeah, it, it conferred some kind of really significant advantage, right? And um, we can think about what these creatures might have looked like. They might have looked something like a, a big giant worm type of uh, sea creature, like an acorn worm, um, if you can look that up or a, uh, yeah, so that, that would, they're very simple, but they have, um, like Taylor's saying, this bilateral symmetry and they also have like a head and that's where this nerves, these neurons start getting um, more concentrated in the head, right? And they're, uh, start to develop more sophisticated sensory mechanisms that allow them to uh, also move in more sophisticated ways. Um, so definitely simplifying this, obviously, <laughs> because we're just traveling through like hundred billions actually of years of uh, evolutionary history and trying to give like a big picture account of this. So remember this whole time, all of this is happening through adaptation, through natural selection, and these gradual evolutionary processes that allow that are acting on um, you know these these slight advantages in survival. That when Taylor talked about like the tube or the the, the uh, yeah the tube like folding in on itself, right? That is something that happened probably over I don't know tens of millions, hundreds of millions of years uh, through slight gradual adaptations over time. Um, so just keep that in mind. I, yeah, no, it's a. Uh, so we're at this point now, though, where we have what looks like a brain, right? We have we have a head, we have a tail, right? We have these anterior, posterior kind of dimensions of the animal. Uh, it's able to sense the environment. It's able to then turn those sensory perceptions into well, I don't want to use the word perception, but it's able to turn that those senses into action plans in order to to do something. And one of the really interesting things in terms of like relating some of this to your own biology now is that you've probably heard that like your right eye goes to the left half of your brain and your left eye, it's not really your left eye, it's your left visual field, but your left visual field goes to the right half of the brain. Uh, and this actually can be traced back to these really early, so we're going to get into to vertebrates now, the, the very first vertebrates that had what kind of looks like all of the pieces that we have now. Um, there's a, a really interesting researcher called Luis Puelas that came up with this idea of the vertebrate bow plan, which is basically like, if you look across all vertebrates, it seems that they actually have all of the same components of the brain that we do. Uh, there's a really popular idea called the triune brain theory that most people probably are familiar with, that you have a reptile brain, and then on top of that reptile brain, there was built this kind of like social limbic brain. And then on top of that was this, this cortex that makes us uniquely human. Um, and that evolution was building the brain in these separate parts. Uh, but when you actually look at, at evolution and you look at the history, and this is something that I fell prey to. If you look at some of my older videos, like I, I thought it was like that until I dug deeper and started getting into this stuff. Uh, but it looks like every vertebrate back to these very first kind of worm-like things all had the necessary parts. And what ends up happening is that different parts of that, that plan, different parts of that brain will get bigger depending on whether or not that part of the brain is necessary for that animal's survival. Uh, so getting to why the eyes to the different parts of the brain is so, so cool, uh, is that these early, there used to be just this one eye patch, which was just like a light detector. But at some point that separated into these, these eyes that were on both sides of the head. And you ended up getting this contralateral projection, which like this, uh, the right eye went to the, the left and the right eye went to the, the right eye went to the left, left eye went to the right. Uh, because if a shadow falls on your right eye, that means that there's probably a predator coming from the right side. And so the reason it's projecting to the other side is because you need to turn the opposite direction to get away from that predator, right? And so you have these early avoidance circuits that start to develop where it's like, okay, there's some kind of thing out there that's approaching me from the right side. I need to swim away to the left or it's approaching me from the left and I need to swim away to the right. Um, and so you have these really early, and this is something that I think is preserved across the entire lineage of evolution, uh, are these really ancient approach and avoidance circuits, which I think serve the basis for a lot of our cognition. 
Like if you really think about a lot of the complex things that we do as humans, it's about what kind of things we're trying to get rewarding, rewarding things, things that fulfill us, that bring some kind of value to our lives, or what are those things that are threatening that are, that we need to avoid. And this is kind of the basic ancient kind of components of those systems that developed. Uh, Cause you have this one that's like avoiding predators, but then you start to uh, develop this other system. That's like, Oh, Whoa, that's something that I want. And so I'm going to approach that thing. Yeah. It's so important to keep in mind that like organisms have goals, right? They have like these goal states to, yep. to, um, fulfill, you know, their hunger needs, their food needs, right? Their nutrient needs, or to get away from a pet predator. That's a kind of, you know, goal. And humans, we, like you're saying, we have these same, uh, or we have these like homologous circuitry. We have this circuitry that has been, um, preserved in many ways, but then on top of that is what, like, this is a preview of getting into human evolution. We have these super sophisticated brains that allow us to not only kind of react to stimuli in our environment, but to really understand it and then to create goals that we then, uh, move toward in, in, in different ways. But of course we're not to humans yet. We're still in <laughs> the very early, the, this would be kind of be before even before fish before the jawless fish but but now we're getting into more and more complex neural circuitry right as taylor's mentioning there's these um really simple feedback loops of a shadow falls on the right eye and it causes you to turn to the left so you can get away from whatever's casting that shadow on your eye right and then the approach mechanisms as well but as we get as things get a little bit more um as you layer more and more neurons, you add more and more complexity to the system, you can start to get more complex goals, right? Um, so one, a, a more complex goal than getting away from something or approaching some like inert uh, piece of food in the environment is to um, be that predator that is actually chasing the, uh, the smaller fish, right? So that's a much more complex goal and it requires more complex circuitry. So kind of predation, the fact that animals started eating each other, right? That is yep. important for the evolution of the brain uh, becoming more and more uh, sophisticated. And I mean, you have this idea, like these, these early animals were not building a model of the world. And in the way that we maybe think about the brain today is like creating this, this model of what we want and all of these things, they were working off these really simple feedback mechanisms, right? Like a, a smaller shadow might be an indication that that's something I can eat. Whereas a bigger shadow <laughs> is probably something I should run away from, right? Uh, it was, it was these really kind of simple, I'm mapping this, this common sensory thing onto a common motor output, right? Uh, and once we get into kind of predation and jawed fish and bony fish and all those kind of things, you start to see the development of the cerebellum, which is really interesting because as these fish got bigger, their own movement was swamping their sensory signals. It was hard to tell what was out there causing things and what is it that I'm causing. And that's really, when you think about what the cerebellum is, right? You, you, we hear it talked about in terms of like fine motor movement of, of really kind of getting really good at, at using our movements in certain ways. What it really is, is the ability to predict what is my movement. And, and that's, that's really, there's this really cool thing that you can do where if you're throwing like balls at a target, and then you put on prism glasses that actually make it look like the targets like way over to the right. At first, you're going to miss the target, but then you're going to start to predict what your actions do. And that's your cerebellum doing a lot of that. And then you'll adjust. And so as these fish got bigger, they needed to be able to, to, to kind of predict and to smooth out their movements so that they could become better predators and all of these kind of things. Um, and so you're starting to see kind of this, these different ways of handling what's becoming more and more complicated sensory information as they start to kind of process it in different ways. It used to be kind of simple shadows, but now they're learning that this shape shadow is probably different than that shape shadow. And the system is starting to kind of lob on to important key stimuli in the world. Yeah. And it's so interesting, the cerebellum, because it's, it's, it's really about like Taylor's saying, predicting your own 
body, but it's about then correcting the errors yeah. too. So it's this this feedback mechanism that allows for that's why it allows for smoother movement. Mm -hmm. um, so you know, people who who do have um, cerebellar damage, like damage to their cerebellum, have trouble moving their like if you're watching this, I'm moving my finger in a straight line, but someone with cerebellar damage might not be able to actually make that smooth movement and be more jagged, right? And you can see why that would be so adaptive for, especially for I mean, creatures living in the sea that have to yeah. make these smooth three-dimensional movements <laughs> through the water to actually get at their prey, right? Um, but yeah, sorry, that was a bit of an aside. No, there. no, no. And I think that, I think one of the most important things that is, important to highlight here before we move to land because that's going to be our next kind of big transition uh is that dopamine started to take on a new role uh around this time that it used to be all about what i, I mentioned earlier which is it's called tonic dopamine where you have high levels indicate that this is good right now what i have is good but then when dopamine drops then it's like oh wow i i need something i need to move i need to explore the environment but now you start to see this really interesting tonic introduction of dopamine, which is what's been referred to as like, uh, uh, you said, what is it? you mean phasic or phasic? Yes. Yeah. Said, no, this, yeah. So the, the phasic dopamine, um, which is essentially tracking like surprising things, uh, and it's, it's like, okay, I have this thing that I'm going to expect. Uh, and then I, something different happened. And so now I'm going to learn something about that. Uh, and so there's this, this new role for dopamine that ends up becoming involved in kind of learning about the world and keeping track of things that produced good outcomes. And so this becomes the start of like a different kind of cognition where you're starting, the, the nervous system itself is starting to track key stimuli in the environment as these are really good approach stimuli. These are really like threatening ones that we should avoid, but there starts to be this kind of holding on to, you might call it a representation of something out in the world that can be used then to infer uh, behavior in a different way than just this simple stimulus response type stuff that was going on. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it, is becomes more and more important to be able to hold on to those representations to basically to form memories essentially, or, you know, if we can refer to them that way as a kind of stable um, re representations of like the environment and what to do in certain contexts. Right. Um, and, and dopamine's evolution is, is one example of how that kind of system came to be more sophisticated over time. So let's go to land, right? Uh, yeah. So we we have this transition. So up until this point, like nothing really. There's there's some insects that kind of made the the migration onto land, uh, but none of the the vertebrates that that kind of end up becoming humans had made it yet. And so you have this first transition onto land that brings a whole new host of new challenges. Right now, I need to find water. Uh, I need to be able to change the way that my vision works because now I have this huge visual range on land that didn't exist underwater, right? There's so many different demands in terms of thermal regulation, in terms of all of these things that produce new types of thermostats, right? Going back to what I mentioned earlier. Now I have a thermostat for thirst that is creating this internal representation of like, hey, I need to remember where water was. I need to know how to get to it. I need to know when my water is depleting so that I can hydrate myself again. Uh, I need to be able to track things long range visually. So you start to see these new demands on the nervous system that produce a level of refinement of earlier existing kind of circuitry that was already there. Yeah, and it, like an expansion of kind of the, the sensory processing regions of the brain is yeah. the, kind of thought to happen around this time. Um, and so like another difference that makes land so different from sea is now you have to move in two dimensions rather than three dimensions. You can't swim up and down in the water, right? Mm -hmm. It's this two-dimensional landscape. So there's a now a need for kind of a new development of a of a uh, motor system along with this sensory system expansion. Um, so, yeah. So as we, we get to land, there's this pressure for the selection pressure for a different kind of brain to develop. Right. 
And I mean, you have you have a lot of these pieces that we've talked about so far, though, because what we're really trying to paint a picture of is the evolution of cognition. Right. Uh, we showed that, like all of these, these really simple organisms have the ability to, to kind of recognize simple associations between things. Now we have a little bit longer term type memory and cognition where we're able to to really track key stimuli in our environment we're on land now we can track water we can start taking note of like this thing this plant this animal whatever it may be is a really good source of nutrition for me and so i'm going to start to create some type of a representation of that thing and i'm going to approach it i'm going to avoid different types of predators or different types of of dangers in this new environment and what I think we want to start to, to kind of paint the picture of is, is how this system is going to get more and more long term, right? Because something that Andrew hinted at is that all of these animals have goals, right? Goals to that really track, honestly, like a lot of the hierarchy of needs, Maslow type stuff, right? I need to fulfill my nutrient state. I need to have food. I need to have water. I need to protect myself from predators. I need to reproduce. So I need to have some type of sociality with other members of my, of my species, right? These are all things that need to be tracked in different ways and kept in balance in certain ways. And so you start to see certain types of control mechanisms in the brain that track maybe when I need to reproduce, or they track when I need to find food or when I find water, like, right. And we're starting to see, like, like Andrew said too, this huge expansion of our kind of sensory capabilities in general. It's no longer just these like shadows anymore. We're developing like really sophisticated ways of interpreting the things that are coming through our eyes in a more kind of long distance way, which is building a kind of more temporally long distant way of, of thinking right? I need to plan how to get from here all the way over there instead of just kind of randomly swimming in my like general area and then exploring every once in a while. You start to see the development of longer and longer plans with these newer animals. Right. And, and I think uh, I just want to throw in a caveat here because it sounds like we're saying that sea creatures and water dwelling animals are just like dumb compared to <laughs> land animals. But the reason that we're, we're building up to, to land mammals is, or land animals is that we're ultimately talking about the evolution of the human brain. Right. But it's true that there are animals that evolved in water, right. Yeah. That are much more intelligent than like maybe we're giving them credit here right now that have kind of longer term um, sort of planning mechanisms and model building of their environment in a way that is very different from the land dwelling animals. But, um, but in general, like as we're progressing from simpler to more complex uh, creatures, what we're talking about is this more, um, this longer distance longer um time frame in which you know they can build models of their environment essentially we're starting to get to that point where we're we're actually building more sophisticated models of the environment rather than just sensory um or sorry uh, stimulus response type of mechanisms that we were talking about before and you start to see this this differentiation happen too. There's something that I, I think we've talked a little bit about it on the show before. Uh, there's these really distinct visual pathways in our brain that are called the dorsal and the ventral stream. And one of them seems to be really involved with uh, kind of location and sh trying to find where things are, how we can move in accordance to those things. And the other one is about identifying things. It's, it's usually called like the where and the what pathway. Um, and this is where this starts to become really sophisticated in terms of having this, this one brain region that's, that's really responsible for identifying these key stimuli in our environment. And then another one that's building a bunch of maps around how we can then move in accordance to those things. Uh, and you start to see this really big expansion in the way in which our motor cortex and our somatosensory cortex, which is basically movement and touch and how those interact, starts to expand and starts to develop like lots of different ways of moving. You think about land animals, there's tons of different ways that they, they move and interact with the world that I think is much more, uh, there's much more variety there than you see with like sea creatures and the way that sea creatures move, the way that they, they do handling behaviors and, and all of that kind of stuff. Yeah. And it's kind of worth noting. Well, yes. Uh, although it makes me think of like the cephalopods and the octopus, the octopus and squid and those kinds of really uh, intelligent and, and just yeah. very different, <laughs> they're very different brains than what we have. They have like an octopus has eight 
tentacles that are all basically autonomous. They have like their own brain. So it's just a very <laughs> different trajectory of evolution. But, um, you know, yeah, anyway, I just don't want to denigrate the sea creatures too much. <laughs> well, one of the things that then happened, so we're kind of on this line to, to us, right? The early mammals actually ended up becoming uh, nocturnal. Uh, because of the fact that there were big, scary dinosaurs out there. And so they started to live at night. And so they actually started to to lose a lot of their visual acuity and started to develop these huge kind of like olfactory sensations of being able to smell, being able to touch their environment. Um, and that actually caused a really big expansion of a part of the brain. You don't have to remember this, but it, it was the, the dorsal pallium in early animals that ends up becoming the neocortex. And because they were using that so much to interact with their environment, when they then become diurnal again, when they become kind of awake during the day again, uh, instead of using a lot of the visual stuff that like reptiles used, they're now kind of using this really expanded thing that they used for olfaction, but then using that for vision. And that's what ends up becoming what kind of develops as the neocortex. And that's so like such an interesting, just little tidbit of evolution to think about how, um, things we can have like a visual system, like lizards and uh, reptiles have a visual system, right? And then mammals have a visual system, but we can be using different uh, brain mechanisms to process visual information and to interact with our environment. Um, so it's just um, one of these, I don't know, things to, to notice about evolution, but yeah, mammals, I mean, mammals, one thing that's super interesting about mammals is that they start to develop a brain that is really large for their body size. So it's, it's proportionate, you know, proportionally, if you look at a, a squirrel compared to a, a lizard of like a comparable size and a bird of comparable size, the squirrel's brain is going to be bigger compared to the others, right? So it's, when we're talking about uh, mammals, we have to start thinking about their brains are getting bigger, right? And they're starting to have this more, well, more complex sociality, right? More complex like interactions with other members of their own species and, and other uh, species, and also more advanced kind of cognitive functions and perceptual functions and the ability to build these more uh, detailed models of their environment. And I think one of the things that's really important for that is that this this part of the brain that expanded that was really important for olfaction uh, in early mammals, uh, it has this distinct architecture to it. Uh, the the cortex has this kind of six layer architecture to it that actually is is really beneficial for creating maps of things out in the world, the way that the the connections are and everything. And so you start to see that there was this huge advantage of using that type of brain architecture for then mapping all of the different senses. So then once we start using vision again, we can now start creating these really intricate maps of the visual world. We can start creating really intricate maps of the auditory world of, we don't as mammals really use olfaction very much, but we start to create these kind of somatosensory maps and all of these things in that, that region that expanded. So again, I want to say like, this wasn't a new region of the brain. It was a region that had expanded and started to get more and more cells in it. Uh, and then started to be used more and take the place of what maybe did kind of visual processing or something like that in earlier animals in, in lizards. Uh, and so you start to see that because of the way that we were able to, analyze the sensory information in a much more kind of uh, vibrant way of being able to like really make sense of differentiable, like noticeable differences between things. Uh, be able to, to notice the kind of the, the, it's like taking a picture on a flip phone from the nineties compared to taking one on like your hundred megapixel S24 ultra right now, right? Uh, is that there, there's a lot more fine detail that allows us to then start creating more and more like detailed maps of the things that we want and the things that we don't want and all of those kind of things. Right. Yeah. And vision is something that we're really going to focus on because of course, like yeah. humans are part of the, the primate lineage of mammals and primates, uh, again, something like as we're, we're getting to primates now, we're about 70 million years ago. 
this region of the brain that that Taylor's talking about, this kind of new cortex uh, region that we we have developed as mammals, really starts to expand in primates. It really starts to get bigger. And when you talk about moving kind of t- toward humans, um, the lineage of primates that is really Im- interesting for, or, or is our our um, common ancestor is the the haplorines or the haplorinians. And what's really interesting about them compared to the other uh, major group of primates called the strepsorines is that the haplorines have an especially large uh, visual cortex, especially highly developed visual system. So like if you look at um, a monkey, um, like a macaque monkey and compare it to a, uh, uh, a lemur, a lemur is a strepsorine, a macaque monkey is a haplorine. We're also haplorines the lemur's visual system is going to be a lot smaller than the monkey or the human or the great ape, right? So we're seeing especially vision is becoming more and more important in the lineage that leads to our species. And a lot of this expansion that happened started to be this connection between vision and motion, right? You look at what monkeys are able to do compared to other species, right? The way that they're able to handle things, the way they're able to pick up things and bring them to their their mouth or whatever it may be. We started to develop lots of different ways of interacting with stuff where you had earlier mammals would kind of just like run around and sniff until they bumped into something that was useful and then they ate it, right? Whereas now you're starting to see this ability because the eyes migrate to the front. So you have this longer range vision that has a lot more acuity to it. You're able to to really understand like that thing way up there in the tree, that's a red juicy apple, right? And that thing is going to be something that's really beneficial to me. And so I'm now going to put together this whole sequence of movements that are going to allow me to go from where I am on the ground right now, up that tree. Now I can also say, you know what, that branch looks kind of dangerous. What if I were to jump over to that tree over there? You start to see the ability to start working through lots of different scenarios that start to give these primates the ability to, to link together goal sets, right? And that's kind of what we're getting at. When we talked about kind of this temporal expansion of the way that we're engaging with the world, the way we're engaging with goals, uh, is that we're able to then see something far away and then put together a whole string of movements that then get us there, right? And this is the beginning of what I think is really important for the transition to human cognition, is the ability to start identifying value far off in the distance and putting together these long strings of things that we then need to do to get there. Yeah, and with something, you know, just an aside, I feel like it's probably no accident that primates have these hands right? They have these really, uh, and their feet are kind of like hands in many cases too. So they have these really dexterous, this ability to uh, kind of finely manipulate the environment, to grab that apple, to understand, like to swing through trees and do these things. So again, it's this co-evolution of the brain's increasingly sophisticated kind of model building of its environment, especially the visual environment, and its ability to do things in that environment and manipulate that environment to attain goals. And that's really important, right? There's uh, there's someone that's it's really famous. Have you ever heard of mirror neurons? Uh, it, the, the work comes from Graziano. Uh, but Graziano's lab, before they discovered mirror neurons, were actually mapping uh, motor maps, right? So a lot of these, these primates, they have, you think about one of the reasons why the cortex was getting so big was because they were developing a huge repertoire of the ways that they can move their body, the way they can move their fingers, the way they can manipulate things, either bring it to their mouth or share it or pick bugs or whatever it may be. What the, what it seems like is happening is that there's a huge part of like motor and somatosensory cortex that has maps of the possible movements that like this is the region that's really responsible for grasping motion. Um, and that's how they discovered mirror neurons because you had someone came in that was like picking up something to eat and that that map that was in that monkey of grasping and bringing to the mouth started to fire when they saw someone else do that, right? But it kind of highlights this idea that a lot of this expansion that was happening was because of this, this plethora of ways that we could actually move our body and interact with the world. And it it kind of, it ties back to a lot of what I've been trying to get at, kind of one of the overall messages in this episode is the idea that all of our sensory information is essentially informing motor movement. 
that we're moving through space to try to achieve something to bring our body into some type of equilibrium, right? And uh, I think we can go a little bit over today because I like we're right at the cusp of humans, and I, I really want to kind of take that leap and talk about language a yeah, little bit and kind of get there for sure. Yeah, we can't. Okay, so <laughs> all right, um, as we so our common ancestor, we have a common ancestor with the great apes, right? And uh, this has been recognized for a long time. I think Darwin noticed this, how similar we are to animals like chimpanzees and uh, gorillas, bonobos, and um, the orangutans. Those are the great apes. And humans uh, have a common ancestor with these, with these animals. And just the, the thing that is significant about the great apes is, again, this expansion in brain volume, the expansion of the cortex, especially, um, they, they, I, I mean, chimpanzees and, uh, gorillas to some extent, they have this ability to start using tools, right? This is again, like a way that they're, they're manipulating their environment in a even more sophisticated way than, you know, just the monkey looking at an apple and how does it get, actually monkeys have this to some extent as well, but, yeah, yeah. but we start to see this, um, like more and more sophisticated uh, brain that is, I think, no accident that also these animals are, are highly social, right? Um, chimps and uh, so chimps and bonobos are our closest um, relatives on the evolutionary tree. And um, if you've ever, you know, seen them or, or read about them or anything, they're like surprisingly human in many ways, especially when it comes to sociality. And, you know, you can teach um, gorillas, how to do sign language. There's all this like super interesting stuff um, that where they start again, sign language is an interesting thing because it starts to lead us to humans. It starts to lead us to um, something really, really special about humans that isn't found anywhere else in the animal kingdom, uh, which is language. I, uh, so, so something that, that Andrew just set up, uh, with this idea of the great apes and kind of where we're moving in terms of symbolic cognition, right? Our ability to, to start representing things internally as symbols and not as concrete things out in the world, uh, I think is a really important transition to, to wrap your head around because everything that we've been talking about so far has been about there being these things that I can see, that I can touch, that I can move towards, that I can move away, uh, that have real things out in the world, right? That I can see right now, that I can work towards. Uh, but now we're starting to see this ability to start thinking about these abstract things that aren't here right now that I can start working towards. That I can, I know what it is and I can start thinking about moving towards it right now. To a certain extent, you see this like with migration, with elephants, whatever, like uh, going to, to new sources of water or whatever it is far away. Uh, but we're starting to see the advent of, of symbols in the form of language being these things that can create really abstract, complicated movement plans, right? And something that that, and this might be kind of a controversial take with some people, but um, I think that most of our cognition is in the service of movement, right? Everything that we've talked about so far has been about these sensory mechanisms that we have that inform our body how it needs to move in the world to bring something back into balance, right? And so a lot of our cognition, we may not be like actually moving our body parts, but we're, we're moving through abstract space, right? We're moving through this like plan space. Uh, and it's still, I think, dictated by a lot of this old circuitry that now just has this kind of like updated module on top of it of like, of like, okay, I have this whole kind of network path circuitry thing for identifying things that are important and for putting plans together, movement plans together on how to get there right? And one of the regions that comes up all the time in the work that I do is the medial prefrontal cortex, which is really kind of robust in terms of when I'm thinking about myself and who I am and, and what kind of things I want and what kind of things I don't want. Uh, it's really, it lights up all the time when I'm thinking about value, things that are valuable to me, right? And what I really think is going on is that our sense of self is in some respect a a plan on where we want to move with our lives, right? That we now have this like this really sophisticated way of representing value, of representing something that we want to approach and something that we want to avoid. And 
everything that we've gone over up until now, I, I kind of mentioned like Maslow's hierarchy of needs in a way. A lot of the animals that we've talked about, these control mechanisms were in service of a lot of the basic needs that we have, food and water and safety, shelter, right? That's what those mechanisms are pushing their behavior towards securing and, and, and getting control of. But as an organism, if we can figure out ways to get really good at maintaining food, right? I have food source. I don't have to worry about food. It's right there, right? I don't have to spend a lot of cognition thinking about where my water is. Uh, I'm in a, a group that keeps me safe. I don't have to spend a lot of time thinking about threats, thinking about shelter, about all of these things. It starts to open up those mechanisms to be used for other things, to create plans that are maybe a lot more abstract, right? That now I can have social goals. Now I can have recognition goals and I can have goals about how I want to fit into the group that I'm a part of uh, that start to, to look a lot different. And they still require movement. They quite require me to do things to serve those uh, but it creates these new, really interesting maps of the world that didn't exist before. Yeah, and it's worth mentioning that the prefrontal cortex, right, this region that is what Taylor's mentioned, the medial prefrontal cortex, but we've also got the lateral PFC that is so highly involved in this kind of planning and decision making. And this whole structure is really important for like executive functions and, and future thought and the kinds of things we're talking about. And it is partly a an expansion of the motor cortex. Yeah. It's an extension of it. And so when we're talking about movement and moving through this abstract space, it's there's a kind of evolutionary um, argument to, to help support that. Now, um, okay, I don't want to like get too far because I, I feel like we have to mention this. So our yeah. podcast is called The Social Brain. <laughs> and the reason we named it that was, was that we we're like, oh, we want to talk about sociality and we want to talk about the, and it's the two of us. So it's kind of social where we're, we're talking about the brain. Um, and I don't think either of us had fully realized that there was this, there's this theory in the evolution of the human brain called the social brain hypothesis. I learned this like later on, but, uh, but basically that it says that humans evolved these really large brains to manage complex social interactions. And you can see this where um, the, the size of a primate's um, like social group, natural kind of groups that they congregate into correlates with brain size. Um, that was like originally thought of, um, came up with by, by Robin Dunbar, this anthropologist. And uh, over time, it's been refined. And then there's other hypotheses that are in competition with it. But I just want to, for the record, say that that is not the reason that we called this show the social brain, but it is a interesting um, happenstance. And it's, so I'm a, I'm a social neuroscientist. And the reason yeah. I'm so interested in evolution is because I, I put someone in, in an MRI scanner and I have them do something social and I get this part of the brain that lights up uh, and you can create all kinds of stories about why that brain region is involved in this kind of thing. Uh, but there was there's a, a really kind of famous quote that, you know, nothing in biology makes sense except for in the light of evolution, that I, I think that that's really important to understand kind of where these cognitive abilities came from. And how much of the circuitry is still kind of preserved across all of these different lineages that make that component of, of social cognition something that can be tied to these other kind of older things that are working under the hood. And like Andrew was just saying, like the frontal cortex, which the, the medial part that I mentioned is like super involved in social stuff, uh, is... <laughs> an expansion of the motor cortex. And when you look at the, the way that the, the frontal lobe is organized, stuff that falls near the back tends to be stuff that's tied to very concrete things out in the world. Like I mentioned, I, I can see that apple, I can touch it, I can grab it. But the further you move forward in the frontal cortex, the more abstract things become that I can start thinking about things like justice and how I can move towards a state of justice, right? And the other thing that Andrew mentioned too is like the, the dorsolateral part of the prefrontal cortex has been really implicated in linking different action plans together in creating chains of action plans, right? And so in order to be social, we have to, we have to think about kind of who that person is, what they want, how I can gain some kind of appreciation or recognition from them. What are the things that they like? What are the things that they don't like? We're creating this whole map of a person. And that's something that like in my work, I can pick up on maps of people. I have a study I'm doing right now where just by looking at the brain data, I can predict above chance who of your five friends you're thinking about. 
That means that the brain has created this, this map of a person and all of the types of, I think that there's associated with that is probably all of the types of behaviors, the types of movements that are appropriate for my interaction with that person in order for me to kind of maintain this kind of homeostasis and balance within my social structure. Yeah. Yeah. And before we, we end, I just want to mention like we've, we've kind of just to wrap it up or, or <laughs> put this into a package, like why are humans so different from other animals? Cause we can talk about all these, these similarities and it, they are there, right? We're made of the same stuff, same cells, our brains in many ways, as we've just been talking about, have all these very similar things to, you know, your dog or, you know, even a, uh, fish in the water outside. Um, there's all these similarities, right? But of course, humans are very different. You know, we're the only animal that has landed on the moon, if you believe that that happened, <laughs> which I do. But anyway, um, or, or can build, conceive of machines and technology and have any chance of realizing those, those really complex plans. And I think for me, like, what Taylor's just talking about. So language, future thinking, um, and, and then I think even those two together are probably enough to explain the rest of what's so interesting about human beings. Cause we're able to reason in a way that seems like no other animal can, especially about the future, think further ahead into the future than any animal can. And that's aided by language, right? And then it allows us to come up with these tools and, and make, technology and, and these really interesting things and, and philosophy and talk and have podcasts and do all this stuff that is dependent on future thought on the one hand, within that like planning and executive functions and all the sorts of things we've just been talking about and language on the other hand. And in fact, those things are really tied together and it's all also tied together with our hyper sociality. We're really super social species, right? And language is kind of a fundamentally social thing. So there's this this congregation of factors that makes us really interesting and really intelligent. And I think, you know, the thing that, that kind of wraps everything up for me too is, is getting back to the, the concept from the beginning of the brain as a control system, that it's trying to put us into certain types of homeostatic states, right? It's, it's able to recognize when we've, we've left some kind of favorable state and then it's able to adapt its behavior to then bring that back into equilibrium. But the thing that I think is really important to notice is that, Throughout evolution, we've created more and more thermostats, right? It used to just be that we just had a thermostat of whether we were hungry or not, right? But now we have, as humans, we have tons of different thermostats that we're trying to keep in balance at all, all times. Like we still have the, the hunger and the thirst one that when those are out of balance, we need to eat or we need to drink. But now we have acceptance thermostats. Like, do I feel accepted? What do I need to do about my behavior to try to get back into favor with the people that I love, right? We have kind of, am I on track with my own personal goals type thermostats, right? These self-actualization type thermostats that tend to really influence a lot of the way that, that we engage with the world. So I think something that, that really stands out for me is taking this reflective approach of trying to understand what your thermostats are. What is it that's really driving a lot of your behavior? What is it in your life that you're trying to put back into balance? Because that's what most of your motor output is trying to do, is trying to achieve some type of social kind of cohesion, is trying to achieve some type of like not being threatened or not being hungry, right? Like you, you can start to become really attuned to this stuff if you start paying attention to it and start thinking of the brain in more of this kind of control manner aspect. Yeah. And, and how do you use these uniquely human capacities like language and yeah. future thought to to help you achieve those goals and um, realize, you know, self-actualize like language again and again, you know, in, in different forms of therapy, language just talk therapy itself is so important for, for bringing us into a kind of emotional balance. And also it's important for planning. It's important for thinking about where you're going to be in the future and reasoning and thinking about your life. And so, you know, if, if I have a takeaway from this too, it's like, don't underestimate the power of language and episodic future thought. It evolved for a reason and you can really use it to your advantage.
So I know this was a lot packed into one hour. We did what, like four and a half billion years in, in a little over an hour. Yeah. Uh, just <laughs> but uh, but I hope that it kind of gave gave you some insight into into how your brain maybe works and where all that stuff came from. Uh, thank you everybody for continuing to tune in. Uh, make sure if you've made it this far, uh, subscribe to our channels, check out our Patreon page. We do like a Patreon only episode once a month. Uh, that's kind of a combination of the two topics that we talk about. So we're talking about evolution. Next one's going to be about development. And then we're going to kind of put the two of them together. So thank you for all of you that continue to tune in. We really appreciate the support. 